In today's video, we will continue with our study of robustness in biological systems and we look at the key organizing principles underlying robustness, the most important of which is what is known as a bow tie structure. So, what are the fundamental organizing principles of biological systems in general or robustness? Do you know of any design principle, any organizing principle so, so far from what we have seen? So, power laws are very commonly observed in biology. Why? We will see that. Exactly, right. So, it's uh, power laws are again con connected quite intimately with robustness, right, because the, uh, the, more, the more number of, you know, uh, uh, hubs you have and so on, right. So, the, there are, you know, the hubs can manage the network much more efficiently in some sense. And there are several low degree nodes that will get attached to the hubs and so on and random failure does not affect the network as a whole, so on and so forth. And we will see how why this works out in uh, reality. So, the key question is, is there a fundamental system architecture for designing a good robust system? Right? And if so, what are the limitations and risks associated with such systems? So, we could probably answer power law for this or scale free. And what are the limitations and risks associated with the system? Targeted, targeted attack. attack, right? So that is the challenge. So if you see, there is no blanket robustness or uniform robustness across the table, right? There, there is robustness subject to something. So there is always, a, you know, a, a boundary for how robust something can be. The more robust you want, maybe the more expensive it is to build such a system or you know maintain such a system. It, uh, biologically speaking, it might demand more ATP, more energy. So, what are the, let us put our wish list down. So, we need mechanisms that preserve the components and interactions against mutation to also be able to generate variation, right. This becomes a requirement when you are looking at biological systems. So, you need components and interactions, you need components, uh, you need mechanisms that preserve the components and interactions against mutation, but they should also be able to uh, uh, generate some variation and that is what you find, right. So, you have the same DNA that is that's basically this is achieved in terms of the degeneracy that you have, right. So, DNA mutations generate variation, they are also robust, one mutation may not change much, one mutation can change a lot as we have seen examples of say, say sickle cell anemia or something, but in general the robustness is uh, maintained, right and modules that robustly maintain their functions against external perturbations and mutations are important and you typically notice that there are highly conserved core processes, modular processes that have fundamental functions such as metabolism, cell cycle, transcription and so on where various modules can be interfaced to create diverse phenotypes. So, there is this very famous uh, quotation uh, from uh, Jacques Monod uh, somewhere in the um, 40s or 50s where he said something like whatever is true for E. coli is true for the elephant. Right, and uh, I don't know, would you agree with him or disagree with him? So, obviously, there are points where you one would agree with, and there are obviously many points where one would disagree with. But if you look at the spirit of the statement, I think uh, Monod clearly understands that E. coli is different from the elephant. But there are so many things that surprisingly hold for E. coli and the elephant. You will find the TCA is the same the tricarboxylic acid cycle and glycolysis is not very different in E. coli compared to the elephant. But elephant will have like several more layers of regulation, there will be several more glycogen phosphorylases, I mean E. coli does not even have glycogen, right. But if you look at glycolysis, right, it is going to be remarkably similar, right and this is the core process that we are talking about here. So, these are perfected modules, right and these modules can play well very nicely with one another. So, it turns out that the overall architecture that meets these requirements is a modularized is a modularized nested bow tie or an R glass which you know will where you know various input and output modules are cons uh, connected via a conserved core. So, what is a um, bow tie going to look like right this is the bow tie right. So, this is your core and you can think of these as fans of input and output. Why does this work? Let us just see. So, this happens in metabolic networks, the world wide web and so on, right. So, you have fans of possible inputs, fans of possible outputs and a core, linked through a core, right. And what do you observe here? 
you find that the fans and cores have different structural properties. Fans are mostly linear pathways, right. So, one place you will be breaking down catabolism, the other side you will be building up anabolism, but then you have a highly connected core of central metabolism which is connected with a few molecules which repeat again and again and again and there is it is highly interconnected and these there are certain currencies or carriers which establish the protocols here literally you know so phosphate is the protocol for energy transfer right atp and so on so let's look at this picture it will become clearer so you have several nutrients which are broken down and then you have a conserved core which breaks down these and builds and makes all these building blocks which then you know go towards much more specialized results. So, let us just consider it again, let us look at this picture, I will try to draw it a little more nicer. This looks more like a bow tie and this is a core, right. So, one alternative for this is you have some inputs here, you have some outputs, inputs you can connect it across directly right from many of these inputs you can try to make one or more of these outputs. Is that a good architecture? But immediately seem no is the answer, but why? Yeah. So, if you have too many pathways like this, so if you remove one of these links, so maybe you know you do not get this output or so on, right, or you know both of these get affected and so on and so forth. So, this basically will not facilitate any regulation or more importantly any adaptation. You cannot, so this is going to be a very fussy pathway, right. You remove one thing, you are going to go. Or you could have like a lot of redundancy which is going to make life even harder, right, which is going to be much more expensive. So, if you see how things inside a cell operate, it is very interesting. You take all your, um, let us talk about just metabolism for example, you take proteins, carbohydrates, lipids and you finally squash them into the various building blocks essentially amino acids, sugars, fatty acids and then you build them again from the ground up. It is not like you take some, uh, some palmitic acid here in your food and you can just convert it to oleic acid directly by adding like couple more carbons never happens right. What happens is it is just all completely broken down into all these fundamental building blocks and then built up. So, so the advantage you have now is you do not have all of these complicated pathways, but instead you have linear pathways here and this is really complicated. The core is highly interconnected, right. So, you have this can be converted to this, this can be converted to this. So, they are all the core molecules. Right. So, all your core molecules are highly, highly interconnected, which means two things. One, you cannot afford changes in the core. Things go wrong in the core, everything goes wrong, much like your hubs, right. These are hubs clearly, <coughs> but it is very easy to adapt, right. Here, you can easily replace some of these pathways by some other pathways right and again here as well. The only irreplaceable part is at the core right. So, overall you have much more evolvability and robustness as a result of this. So, what are the functional advantages? So, if you had a flat architecture 
you would have to have individual pathways from every substrate to every product is going to be inefficient, very difficult to regulate and utterly unevolvable. On the other hand bow ties will accommodate divergent demands on metabolic systems. So, you can have high throughput of metabolites through the system using just a few functional enzymes and you can have integration and regulation facilitated at different time scales right. So, all these can operate across slightly different time scales right. The core is where you have no latitude, the other things can operate at slightly different time scales. The stoichiometry is also highly structured right. So, to facilitate control and these shared interfaces and protocols like say ATP or NADP and so on gives you the plug and play features which will help you connect you know the less central reactions and uh, you know the more central reactions and the less central reactions can obviously be swapped out more easily without causing damage right. The core is the constant part you cannot afford any change in the core, but you can easily disconnect reconnect put another module take out another module in the periphery this is the advantage that gives you. What are the disadvantages if something goes wrong in the core right or you have very little leeway in the core as such. So, it is associated with risks that are not present in simple systems it is a very complex system right. So, there is high fragility when things in the core go wrong. So, there is low variability of the core what is an obvious disadvantage of this. So, when you actually design drugs this becomes a big pain. So, when I target protein translation I kill all bacteria I want to kill only a particular disease causing bacterium, but I basically nuke the entire uh, set of bacteria that are there in my gut the beneficial bacteria whatever right because the core is highly highly conserved. So, and robustness and facility are actually inseparable. So, the system is highly sensitive to ATP concentrations, but it is also very tightly regulated. So, this is fragility and this is robustness and it is in the same thing right. So, a scale free network is robust because of its hubs and is fragile because of its hubs. Very interestingly in many complex systems the size of cascading failure events are often unrelated to the initial perturbation. You can have like a small change in something which will lead to a completely massive change in the output like almost like a chaotic system right you have a very. So, this is where there are certain axes on which the system is highly highly sensitive overall the system is very robust, but there are certain axes. So, the system is extremely sensitive to ATP concentrations right. Many other things the system would not budge nothing happens very robust, but if ATP concentrations are like really tweaked around then the system will behave you know very chaotically. And fragility is also therefore, interesting because it arises not because of large perturbations, but catastrophic response to a small variation clearly you see that in a scale free network you might knock out one hub node and that might really damage the network very badly right. Any other node you knock out so knocking 5 nodes knocking 10 nodes that is not the problem it is what you knock out. So, the size does not matter, but the the you know the relative importance of where you strike and how it cascades through the network is what is uh, more important. So, in today's video I hope you understood what is the one very important underlying organizational feature of robustness in biological systems namely the bow tie architecture and in the next video we will start looking at the trade offs right. So, it is not that a system can be completely robust, but there is always some fragility as well and there is also a lot of complexity and how all these three quantities are in some sense related. So, there is also this interesting concept called highly optimized tolerance that we will briefly overview and I will also introduce you to the concepts of robustness versus evolubility right. So, robustness and evolubility sound um, inimical almost right because robustness is resistance to change and evolubility is ability to change, but strangely these two coexist in biological systems we will see how.